Welcome to this week's weekly charting analysis webinar, where we will discuss some of the important charts and fundamental events taking place in the markets this week. So, um, for any of you trading the UK 100 or just um, maybe not even trading but watching some of the media today, you're hearing um, talk of us getting close to, uh, to all-time highs. So what we had here is um, an interesting one and just highlights some of the differences you can get sometimes because um, our pricing is derived from futures markets on the FTSE 100. And then you obviously have the cash price, which is what's quoted by the business media sort of during the day. And so here was the, the last kind of official closing price on Friday which was kind of down in and around these these uh, multi you know multi year high levels, um, but then we got a bit of a ramp up after hours, and uh, we subsequently sort of ramped up and dropped down again, and um, so we saw some some higher prices early on today, but we've kind of just been dropping back, um, namely just because HSBC reported some disappointing results, and HSBC makes up um, a good chunk of the, the FTSE 100, you know, the FTSE 100 is mostly comprised of banks and uh, miners and, and oil companies. Uh, they make up the bulk of the, the volume there, which is why the index, partly part of the reason why the index is underperformed, um, those in America and, uh, and the rest of Europe, because those sectors have not really been faring too well since the, uh, the financial crisis. Banks are just getting slammed with, uh, with fines. Uh, you know, this latest one that hit HSBC related to the, the Forex rigging scandal, and they won't be the only ones for sure. And uh, so that's, you know, that's why we've got disappointing banking results, and obviously this slide in commodity prices is um, not too good for the mining companies. If we pull out the um, the daily chart, we can see here that we kind of popped higher on Friday, most of which was in the sort of after hours trading. We've got an open today, which was up above, at some point, the cash price was trading above our all-time closing high, which is about 6, 9, 30 and change. And then the all-time int yeah, intraday high, which happened during normal trading hours for the cash index, um, is 6, 9, 50. So that's the one to sort of keep an eye on in terms of sort of what's widely thought of as the all-time high in, in the FTSE 100. And it's something to take in mind when you're trading this UK 100 product that we offer, which, uh, which tracks the, the futures in the FTSE 100. So, you know, why, why is that taking place? Basically, because of quantitative easing in the, in the eurozone, We'd, if you've been watching these webinars for a while, we've been saying really, um, even though the UK economy is improving, looking at the FTSE 100 for the reasons I mentioned before, um, there's a lot of reasons to hold this index down, um, uh, as as there are fundamentally in terms of the economy for a lot of the European indices. The only thing that's really going to push them up to new or some highs is if they put out a quantitative easing program that uh, matches that done in, in the US. And, you know, that's what that's really exactly what we're seeing right now. It's no coincidence that the uh, FTSE 100 is pushing into its all-time highs um, just as, as, as quantitative easing is about to begin next month. The timing is not, not uh, coincidental. Um, that's the, really the biggest driver here. Obviously, what pushed us above um, on Friday was that uh, we did have some um, solid signs of an agreement over the, the Greek deal. You know, obviously, that's what's been pushing European markets around a lot. And you know, that's, that you can see better in the, uh, the German DAX or as, as, as we trade at the, the Germany 30. And... Uh, got it on a pretty short time frame chart there, but you can see we had that push through 11,000 um, quite dramatically on Friday, and uh, we're just pulling back a bit again today. It's, um, there's not too much in the way of economic data, and the data that we have had was the German IFO, uh, the sort of business sentiment um, survey comes out once a month, and it was slightly ahead in expectations and current conditions, but uh, just not as much as expected, and it's just a little bit disappointing. Uh, numbers were below forecast, and as I said, there's not, you know, we had a, quite a strong rally last week in general, 
and on Friday especially on that uh, that sort of Greek agreement news. And obviously Monday we're getting a few more headlines out about um, there are still some disagreements and it's still not 100% that uh, the other Euro, Euro group finance ministers are going to accept uh, these conditions that Greece are willing to to have on the extension of their bailout, uh, namely sort of structural and economic reforms. A uh, big sticking point has been the amount that Greece have to um, keep in uh, the budget surplus. So, you know, government receipts, how much the government gets in versus how much the government spends. You know, it's it's meant to have money, 3% more money left over when those two are netted out. And um, in, in terms of the government helping to stimulate the economy in times of massive unemployment, you know, that's that's pretty difficult. You know, that's basically austerity right there. And so the sticking point is whether that three percent holds as Germany would like, or in fact it drops closer to one point five percent, which is what um uh Cypras and um Varoufakis, uh, you know, the the Prime Minister and the finance minister in Greece, so that's that's what they're pushing for. And, you know, they could use that one point five percent to plug into the Greek economy and hopefully stir things up and get things going again. Um, so still very much the, the Greek news in picture. You know, I would say, I mean, you can see here on this chart that the, you know, 11,000 is the big round number. The uh, quantitative easing is about to kick in, Should unless we see some sort of dramatic um, fall apart of these agreements, there's a good chance that 11,000 can hold again as some kind of support. And you'd maybe have, depending on how long it takes for us to get down there, you know, this is this is kind of like the uh, the breakout here. You see that we opened up there, test back into that kind of break, and so we could dip down towards that 21-day moving average again. Um, to me, just above there, I think yeah, the, that that's quite good value if we get down there. And then you've got the risk below this low, probably a break through this trend line. I think would maybe indicate that um, we've gone a bit too far too soon, and then we could even push back down to the 55 again. But for now, you can see we held it three times. We've been holding above the, the, um, you know, even even as even as, um, the, all these days that you see here, when when the um, these Greek bailout talks were kind of fluctuating up and down, you can see markets really didn't go too far. You know, the base was about ten five fifty, with the top at eleven eleven thousand. So even as things, you know, there was talk of a Brexit really heavily being on the table. Markets never really priced that in. And uh, you can see there's just, there is no real interest with QE about to come out in a major in a major dip right now. Even with, um, over the last few weeks, we've had uh, news out of Ukraine and um, there was a ceasefire. Now the ceasefire is looking a bit dubious. There's uh, still fighting going on over there. But nevertheless, that even that is not holding down uh, this, the Germany 30. So I think, Good probability that this form of resistance holds us support, but if not, obviously we have to open up the idea that it um, can drop down further again. But to me, that's the base case scenario. Looking at the way the markets behaved during this fairly tumultuous news period, um, I didn't mention before, um, but uh, obviously any questions over any particular market you're interested in, um, certainly feel free to just send me a quick message through and I will cover those. Uh, so we've got into the, um, the UK 100, um, the Germany 30. Um, let's have a look at uh, the US major benchmarks. Um, not much uh, news going on in the, uh, the US at the moment. Um, uh, just as of, t well, basically there isn't any news really today. We've got a bit of housing data, but, um, you know, the, the housing data has, has been so choppy. There's basically a choppy housing recovery going on in the U.S. Uh, nothing like as impressive as what's been happening in the in the U.K. And uh, that data is, you take it or leave it, to be honest. It will maybe move prices a little bit on the day. It's not going to give you too much of a picture of what's going on, in my opinion. The big one this week, for probably for marketing as, as a whole, Maybe does shift away a little bit from um, from Europe, especially if some some deals can be come to today. Then uh, really tomorrow it's going to be all about uh, Janet Yellen's testimony to this. Firstly, the Senate Banking Committee. That's that's really the big one, just because it's the first day. It's, it's 
fairly un unusual that they, on the second day that she would then come out with something, you know, really market moving that she wouldn't have said in the first meeting. So the, t uh, tomorrow is going to be the big one. And what we're really looking for is just some sort of idea as to whether the more sort of dovish tones that we heard from the last uh, Fed statement, which sort of uh, referenced international concerns and um, even uh, and just sort of uh, there was a there was a paragraph in there that basically sort of came, uh, stated along the lines that the uh, uh, majority of members uh, sensed that there was a sort of risk to um, raising rates too soon. The, the, the tendency was to want to hold rates in a zero bounds uh, for longer, and you know that was the big one, <clears throat> and um, no no real signs yet of. Um, of sort of pulling out the patient's wording from the Fed statement. So whether uh, Janet Yellen uh, comes out today and confirms those kind of more dovish tones or, um, you know, or actually kind of strikes a more hawkish stance, which is what, the way the Fed has been in the last few meetings, um, that will, you know, that will definitely have some impact on, on U.S. markets today. And um, obviously all these markets are, are interrelated. We did see, as you can see on our charts here, new all-time highs in the the U.S. 30 on Friday. We uh, the the the, the, um, the Dow Jones Industrial Average has been underperforming the S&P a little bit recently. So if we look at our U.S. 30 chart, um, then what we can also do is um, well, just for the fun of using some of the different tools that we have in the platform, let's uh, drag in the S&P 500. And you can see that obviously the markets are pretty pretty well correlated here, um, but you can see the s and p five hundred has been actually pushing ahead a bit, and some of these kind of um, more blue chip names like mcdonald's and and the likes have not been faring so well, um, whereas some of the kind of more growth type companies um, have actually been outperforming so that kind of wider Benchmark the S&P has been has been doing better. So we actually saw three record highs last week in the S&P 500. Just one on Friday for for the uh, the Dow Jones Industrial Average. Nonetheless, both are all-time highs. So you know we're we're basically on the cusp potentially of a breakout of this uh, this trading range that we spent um, the duration of of December, January, and three three quarters of, of February in, and we're. Uh, you know, now we're kind of setting up quite well for um, continuation higher. You know, this is a bullish, strong bullish engulfing candlestick that we saw on on, um, uh, on the DAX. It, it didn't come at the bottom of a downtrend, which is kind of ideally what you want to see as a reversal signal, but um, it did come within an uptrend. So um, not necessarily going to catalyze such a large move, but it's in the direction of the trend. Um, so then what we could be looking at is the top of that breakout candle or perhaps the um, the open and at the very worst you know the low of that that um, that bullish engulfing as some kind of um, interim areas of support should we get a bigger pullback um, but I'm, you know this this you know we saw here just a little breakout and then drop back into the range so there is some scope that you know there's just a kind of a bit of a kind of wedge going on perhaps um, and that we don't get too much higher and dip down again. So be aware of that possibility. Um, but I think while we're trading and making new highs, you know, you've got to assume it's um, it's uh, it's an uptrend. And just look for um, the potential. For, I mean, looking at that, it's a very bullish pattern. If that gets undone, and we see a move below that, you know, that's a you know, obviously we're a lot lower prices at that point. And if you know, if you really want to fine tune your timing, you can wait for a little short term bounce on the lower time frames, but really kind of some kind of move below there is a big bearish signal because basically that bullish, bullish signal has been undone. So there's obviously some, some more stronger bearish forces in the market and it would just be an indication that actually we haven't made it properly out of the range yet. So this was obviously on a daily basis, uh, but because it was a Friday, it made it on a weekly basis too, which um, adds some strength to it. Um, if, I'll just, if I just cut the S&P out of there again, we can switch and see that on the weekly chart. Uh, 
Um, okay, yeah, while well, we are talking about indices, we've got a question on the uh, the Norway 25 here. Let's just pull that one up. Obviously, the big driving force of the Noki currency and the Norwegian index has been all prices since it is such a um, you know large component of the Norwegian economy. Um, but we've got to also keep in mind that Norway is um, you know is a, a big trading partner of Europe. So that's you know if the eurozone economy improves, that is a positive for Norway. Um, but um, you know if we see a continuing weakening of the euro, you know that benefits um, European exporters to the detriment of Norwegian exporters, and um, so that that makes competition with the you know the local economy um, you know that, that that much trickier. Um, but I think you know similar to the um, the UK 100. Um, even though Norwegi uh, Norway is not a direct beneficiary of quantitative easing, it's a sort of indirect beneficiary. Some of that 60 billion in euros being flooded into the market each month is going to make its way across the borders, not even just inside Europe, but probably a little bit to Asia, um, definitely to the US, given the outperformance of those markets in the past few years. And I think what we're seeing in this chart here, we've seen a sort of break out of this line. Looks a bit clear on the weekly chart. You can use um, as an example of perhaps closes a little bit nicer. And you can see, <coughs> uh, I don't know if this line, can I, memory serves, I think this one was it? No, it doesn't work that well, was it that one? This is one of those cases where you know, you just end up finding a spot that works. And so that's the nature of trend lines. You just look around for one that fits. Um, I think probably the best was really just having that as a, um, a general floor in prices. Um, which is kind of just flat around 480, and we and we just hold that a couple of times, and we've had strong moves, a big solid break through that declining trend line, and I think there's some scope for a move back towards the trend line again. Um, perhaps even you know, um, uh, perhaps even shake a few weaker longs out of the market with a dip down to this kind of breakout area that we saw here, and that would be a confluence of um, support from these broken weekly moving averages. Everyone uses different weekly averages, obviously. I tend to find that the, the 21 uh, and the F55 work quite well on multiple time frames. You can see here that it's not perfect, uh, but nothing is. Um, but you know, when you see a false breakthrough and a move back above, even that in itself is quite a good signal, even if it hasn't perfectly bounced on it. Um, so to me, that you can still use those as some rough areas of support. And, and that, that the high from that consolidation area that we broke strongly above before breaking the trend line, that's the next area of support below. Failing that, we're looking at the lows here. This, but this was a, you know, obviously a strong uh, morning star pattern as it turned out. Uh, candlestick, so a lot of bullish indications going on at the moment. Bit of a pause here after we broke out. Chance of a dip back could go further down. Um, but my suspicion isn't much like the other indices. It's, it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to move up and challenge these highs again, um, and that's that may be somewhat. In, you know how quickly that happens could be influenced by uh, where the crude is is basing out here. It looks like it is, um, but if we flip over to <coughs> um, WTI was something I was looking at in more detail. Um, it's not looking quite so good at the moment. Um, we've had a f few failed attempts at 54 in WTI. Do I have that? Oh, I've got open already. <clears throat> so here, this is the daily chart. <clears throat> I'm sure you've all seen this, but 54, as I mentioned, well, I've kind of got a bit lower than 54 on my chart, but that's really the key round number. Three failed attempts. And so you can see sort of what was happening here is that we basically had the 21-day moving average. In this instance, it was actually working perfectly as uh, support bounced off it three times, bounced off 54 as resistance three times, and now we're moving back below the 21-day moving average. So could be a false break, could get a move back and close um, above 50 again. That would be quite a strong signal maybe to the, to the bullish side. Um, 
but at the moment it's not looking too good. If we get a close in this kind of vicinity, that to me suggests that uh, we're going for another test down at the lows in oil. Uh, just because, you know, we get, we'll be getting back some force in the oil price, basically with the idea that some of the big oil companies are cutting, um, uh, cutting their, uh, you know, their research, uh, research um, uh, lost for words here, but basically cutting their capital expenditure budgets. And, uh, and then we're also, we're also seeing a drop in the, the rig counts. Um, the, the Baker Hughes rig count comes out every Friday. And um, it, it's dropping by, you know, tens of rigs um, every week, and it's it's quite a large percentage at this point, sort of 400 or so in the last couple of months, I think, um, out of a total of was about 1,700 now. It's in the sort of 1,300 vicinity. Uh, those numbers are not perfect, but that's about right. <clears throat> um, so some signs that eventually that those reduced rigs will – results in less production, but at the moment there's not less production, there is more production, and that you can see that in the inventories built up every Wednesday. Um, last week it was on Thursday because we had the US holiday, but um, that, those, their record levels of inventories, i.e. all that oil is being produced, um, but it's not, um, it's not being used, so it's just being stockpiled. So even though we've had a bit of a sort of um, chance of reduced production, maybe later even this year, Still, it's not happening right now, and there's a risk that we can just break even back through the 44 again and push lower. So, um, it's it's still a brave bet, in my opinion, um, going long oil. But you know, it depends again, like everything, how much um, you're willing to accept in risk on the downside. Or is never going to go below zero. Um, so, so yes, that uh, performance in that uh, Norway, Norway 25 may be, may be contingent somewhat on this 44 level holding, and not so much WTI. Obviously, it's more Brent. That's the kind of global benchmark that's more related to to Europe. Uh, but really, the same. We can have a look at the Brent chart here, and you can see it's kind of much the same picture. Obviously, that's um, the monthly chart with the scope of the dip we're dealing with. Um, Huh. Yeah. Well, so you can see that's that's what we're dealing with on the on the longer term basis. I think I've lost my um, short term analysis. A bit more strength in Brent, just because it's this U.S. inventory data that's been uh, you know particularly weak for the price. Um, but uh, if we get a dip, there's a little rising trend line going on through there, and there's similar risks posed of a, a break through that's maybe best drawn on a four hour chart. Something along these lines. Twenty on which um, you know that's a bit of a spike low there. You can see a, a lower high being formed, potential of a lower low, break of a trend line three different signs that the trend is, is reversing and like, turning lower. Not to say there's not some support low, low, down here in the middle, and we have to go right back to the lows, but you know, to me that's, that's a strong possibility. So in terms of if you are trading the Norway 25 and, and, and indeed oil prices, it's those two uh, data pieces which we're going to again, again see this week which could be of strong influence. Uh, those, as well as, again, back to this um, Fed meeting. Uh, not Fed meeting, so but uh, the the, um, uh, the te uh, Janet Yellen testifying, um, you know, that's going to affect the U.S. dollar. So if we have a look at the um, – well, let's have a look at the dollar-yen because that's tending to be a bit more – moving according to the US dollar, then the euro has got, obviously got its own set of influences at the moment. Um, here, the dollar-yen, well, yes, I mean, this is this has been sidelining, and I think it is because we haven't really, you know, we got a, a bit of a kind of a source of confusion from uh, the latest Fed statement. I believe that was behind that. Um, no, that wouldn't make sense. But 
we've um, you know we've got a potentially weaker dollar picture here, which well, I suppose that does correspond to that. <clears throat> Whereby you know if the if the Fed is suddenly becoming a bit more dovish and worried about some of the macroeconomic indicators, which have been a bit weaker, uh, particularly look at um, you know retail sales. You know the hope was that the drop in oil prices was going to feed through um, into um, into people going out and spending. We even have, we even saw some weak confidence data last week. Um, the University of Michigan. So if consumers are not confident and not spending, even when oil prices have dropped this much, which obviously makes up quite a large amount of the average person's income in, in America, especially because they drive so much. Um, if that's not going to do it, what is? You know, and that's that's maybe a source of some of the worry for the Fed. Even though we're getting such strong employment numbers, um, the jobs being created are not such that are really um, producing amazingly strong wage growth. <coughs> so, that being said, um, you know what um, Janet Yellen says in the next couple of days is going to affect the U.S. dollar, and that is also going to affect oil prices. Um, keep in mind that if you if you bring up, um, if we can do it here. Let's um, bring up a couple of cheap, clean charts here. Chart of the euro. Um, let's make it. Um, let's just make it line chart to make it very simple. And then we bring in Brent. Uh, this is well, a fall in Brent. Obviously, percentage is just difficult to do this. What we need is more like a log scale. The point I was trying to make, it's difficult to make on the one day chart, we need more like a weekly chart, <coughs> is that they both sort of peaked around June last year and have been declining since. Obviously, the fall in oil has been a lot bigger than the fall in oil, but you can see the kind of basing. You know why? Why is this? Why? Why? Why is there some signs that um, you know tends they tend to roll over at the same sort of time? Um, it's basically U.S. dollar related. So again, anything that the Fed is doing is is going to not only affect the major currencies but also affect um, oil prices and affect any indices like the Norway 25 or even the FTSE 100 and the, the U.S. 30, which obviously have the big oil majors in there. Um, is going to affect the performance there too. Uh, we're running out of time here, so I'll just I'll jump over to gold, which um, has been particularly disappointing for any of those who are sort of um, gold bugs out there, or just at least hopeful of higher prices. This, I think, is um, a very simple weekly chart, which is kind of defining where we are at the moment. Um, there's another potential trend line that you can draw through above to these highs. We didn't get that far. I think really it's these, the connection of these two highs it's, which has been used here. And obviously that round number of 1,300, we've got the push through, um, a little fake breakout, and then a um, sort of um, <coughs> gravestone uh, doji sort of type pattern here, hanging man type pattern. And then, a, and then just a drop back into this kind of uh, triangle pattern. So we obviously have this break, this false break below 1180. Um, couldn't sustain below there. Push back up, but we'll just bounce right into this this triangle resistance. Um, and so now we're right back at this rising trend line, uh, which is co which is a bit of confluence of support with this 1180 long-term support. So. This, uh, to me, is the last last hope for gold. Back down through 1180. Of course, we could just bounce off these lows around 1135 again, um, and yeah, I'm sure we will do that to some degree. But I don't think it's going to last too long. We might bounce into 1180 again, and then I think, you know, I was a bit more hopeful in gold with this. You know, there was a little kind of inverse head and shoulders pattern going on here, which could have pushed us higher up into these highs. But even then, I wasn't confident we could get past those highs. As it is, we haven't even made it to those. And if this pattern were to play out, it's not even necessarily just a triangle, which would have the height of that area projected down. It could even be a, uh, a bare pennant 
which would be using this as a pole, and then the, the height of that pole projected down as well. Um, so that would bring us at substantially lower prices, like below $800 per ounce. <coughs> So that's the big long-term winning gold I, I thought worth mentioning there. And actually, well, we've got a little bit of time. I'll just chuck home on silver as well, because that's even more obvious. This is just, you know, maybe you don't want to, you know, for, when you look at these longer-term charts, you could come away with a few different thoughts. A, hey, maybe I should be trading these longer-term charts. They look so clean and easy to trade with the benefit of hindsight. <laughs> or you could at least think I need to pay attention to them to, like, help orientate my, my shorter-term trading. Um, or you can just think, well, some of the kind of simple concepts that you see in these longer-term charts, I can at least apply those to my short-term trading, like this one being a very obvious uh, support, breakthrough, support turns into resistance, and now we're dropping back down. And then, if, you know, very simple use of the RSI. We're heavily oversold. We managed to get back through 50, but we failed at the 60 level on RSI. Um, weren't able to push through into a kind of bullish zone in RSI, failed at 60, dropped through 50, retest, down again. So now we're even below 50 on the RSI, we dropped below the uh, 21 week in silver. So a bit like oil prices, we've had a bounce, but now we look like we're going in and testing the lows again. Um, I wouldn't be surprised to see us sub 15 in, in silver. Um, so not sure I've um, covered everything. You know, it's very difficult to do that. Um, uh, if anyone has any other sort of questions about, you know, kind of key things they should be looking for this week or any particular market they wanted me to cover, a um, couple of rough things of note I should mention from the economic calendars. We've got the second estimate of the UK GDP on Thursday. Uh, that one will be big for the pound, which we haven't discussed in detail. Today uh, we have got Draghi speaking on Wednesday. That might end up, that you know that will be a bit later. Well, actually, um, yeah, that'll be a bit later on. Um, so probably maybe may more influential on Thursday's trading. Um, that may end up weighing more on the market than Yellen's second speech. Like I said, it will probably be Yellen's first speech on Tuesday, which is of more influence. Um, and then um, the preliminary GDP release for the U.S. on Friday, as well as uh, French and German CPI on 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 Friday, which kind of maybe, especially if there is some sort of resolution, at least temporary in Greece, does bring us back to what's what's the main kind of driving force here in the euro and European markets is that we've basically got deflation in Europe, and that's why the the, the ECB are engaging in quantitative easing. Right, well, uh, yeah, that's, I think that's about it. <clears throat> thanks, thanks very much for attending the, the webinar. Um, good luck with trading this week. Uh, and this is Jasper Lawler signing off.